I'm Tim, welcome to Watch You Want, and thanks for logging on. Well, it's Friday evening, but I have to share a little bit of truth with you guys. Full disclosure, we taped this one on Thursday. Faylene is going to be on vacation just as I was last week. All things equal, fair is fair. So this is coming to you perhaps one day too soon, so if the Rolex smartwatch launch or a cool video of Terry Stern water skiing breaks in the next 24 hours and somehow I miss that, uh, all apologies. Otherwise, I'm going to try to condense this week in watches with the previous week in watches as I was not here last Friday. So I'm going to try to make these weeks in watches the focus of tonight's show. So first things first, even though we are taped, I want to thank our entire audience that views live. You guys make this the best job in the world. Interacting with you on the live chat is always a highlight for me. And I'm going to see if there isn't a way I can do a live chat of some kind over the weekend to make up for this in advance of Monday's mailbag episode. Now, again, these are going to be the weeks in watches. So we're going back a little bit of a half month to cover some of the most interesting events and new model debuts in the watch industry. So first let's do a unconventional feature. We usually talk about watches first. Let's talk about people and events. So one of the most interesting changes at the top of the industry was the musical chairs at Glossuta Original. October 20th, uh, Thomas Meyer succeeded Jan Gamard as the CEO of Glossuta Original. Now, of course, Glossuda Original is the German branch of the Swatch Group, a small, largely self-contained manufacturer. They build almost everything in-house, and they're very different from the other Swatch uh, high horology companies in that they are almost minimally dependent on companies like ETA to supply them with parts. So, Thomas Meyer has been with Swatch since 1994, but he's only been a member of the extended board of management since about 2005. Jan Gamard, in contrast, has been on the extended board since 1998, but I guess the most interesting distinction here is that we're seeing the passing of the baton from Gamard, who is an MBA with a focus on business administration, to Meyer, who's educational background and profession is engineering. Now, I'm not sure if this is going to have any impact on the day-to-day -day affairs of Glossuda Original or its product focus. Gamard will be staying with the company, focusing on sales and brand development within the critical Northern European markets. So it's good to see both men staying with the Swatch Group and both men staying with the brand. Glossuda is probably the most interesting brand within the Swatch portfolio. Now, jumping forward, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but there are some auctions that I completely gloss over or miss entirely. Not everything's of equal interest to watch enthusiasts, and I have to be perfectly honest, sometimes I'm selfish with auction news and I just kind of focus on what I like. So it's going to be a mixture of uh, throwing you guys a bone and focusing on the part that gets me jazzed, because I'm talking about possibly the most interesting auction of Jezur LeCoult watches that I've seen in a while. Now, Antiquorum dropped its catalog for its November 13th Geneva auction in the last week, and it includes 24 awesome lots of LeCoult and Jezur LeCoult watches, and I picked out some highlights that really struck me as cool pieces at great value with tremendous enthusiast interest. And I tried to spread it out a little bit between JLC, LeCoult, wristwatches, pocket, and clocks. So tell me if I did a decent job in the comment thread below this one, because I know you're watching it recorded. Okay, lot 414. Jump into sort of the end of the conveyor. This one is a caliber 494A triple date moon phase. These were made from the mid-1940s to the early 1950s in successively more complicated iterations. This one's great because it features all the bells and whistles. The triple date with the moon phase. So that's a caliber 494 in a 36 millimeter stainless steel teardrop lug case. Now, the same caliber family was used in Vacheron calendar watches of the time, and those trade at a multiplicity of premiums over the JLC variants, but they're not necessarily better built, nor are they exceedingly better finished. So I would say that this is a great value for someone who wants to get into an awesome mid-century dress watch with an awesome complication from uh, impeccable pedigree, Jezur LeCoult, back when they truly were the watchmaker's watchmaker to the body of Swiss high horology. And at 36 millimeters, you're looking at a very substantial case size for a watch of this vintage. At the same time, JLC was making watches with 
approximately 30 millimeter case sizes for their smaller calendar watches. So this is the jumbo, it's the one to get. Uh, and with an estimate of 2400 to 4400 US dollars, you're getting into the cream of the crop at a price that frankly wouldn't even buy you an entry level Rolex today. And yes, Philippe Dufour, that Philippe Dufour, has one of these in his personal collection, so you'll be in good company at your next Red Bar meeting. Now, in terms of classical diving watches, we've got your bases covered. Lot 9, they're front-loading this one, is a Gesher Lecoult dial, so European dial, E859 Polaris Diving Alarm. This is the 1968 dial design, JLC signed. They were also signed Lecoult during this period, but this is the dial that you remember from the 2008 tribute to Polaris. Now, it's an interesting watch because it also comes married with an extract from the archives that pairs that case number with that movement number. So you've got JLC testifying as to the authenticity of this piece. Now, with an estimate from 8,000 to 12,000 US dollars, I have to say this is going to be one hell of a buy because in that range, you'll see the tribute to Polaris trading in steel. And that's essentially a you know, a limited edition, but readily available pre-owned contemporary watch. This lot number nine is the real thing. The crystal isn't pretty, but replacements are available. If you get this watch for $10,000, believe me, that's going to leave a lot of money for a new crystal and perhaps a full restoration at the manufacturer and still come out ahead versus what these things were trading at closer to the 2008 launch of the Tribute to Polaris. Back then, 30 $40,000 was not unheard of. If you can get it for a quarter of that, consider it well bought. And again, extract from the archives, this one has a real pedigree. Uh, now moving forward, I want to focus on a watch that's kind of quirky, but a great buy, and I feel an overlooked value in a field that's just now coming into collector awareness, collector recognition, and that is the 70s. Well into the quartz era now, uh, we're just seeing the first cracks of the quartz crisis in Switzerland between the 1970 and 1972 period. We're past the Beta 21s, now we're into the Seiko Astron era, and JLC issued the E873, a Memovox. It's actually a version of the E861, but with the high beat caliber 816. So only about a thousand of these were made between 70 and 72. They are super funky in appearance, and with a combination of blue and orange on an impeccably preserved dial, this one's not just a great survivor, but with the cushion case and the satin finish, it looks to be mostly intact, maybe even a grade or two above your survivor daily driver. Consider this to be a great buy and a fantastic watch that may not be worth anything in the short term. 1500 to 2500 is a great entry level price for a watch with that pedigree, but let's be honest, there are many more prosaic Hoyer and Universal Geneve watches from this period being bid up beyond that. This watch has the pedigree. It has a sense of fun and jovial spirit to it that's in kind of the the zeitgeist of its age and will bring a smile to your face and that of other collectors who appreciate the back catalog classics with long range collector potential. Now I want to go off uh, the beaten path of wristwatches now. I've often said that vintage pocket watches are massively undervalued and I don't think the prices should go up. I want to see them stay accessible for the true connoisseur, not the speculator. But you might have to fight me for this one. I gotta warn you. Lot 394, you're going to want to look this one up. Lecoult, minute repeating, split second, 18 carat double hunter case enamel dial pocket watch. Think about that. Minute repeating, split second chronograph. Consider that JLC has never made a split second chronograph wristwatch, and now you realize what you're talking about. Rare, exceptional, part of the class of repeating calibers that helped to make JLC the watchmaker's watchmaker in the mid to late 19th century. By 1900, they had over 90 minute repeating calibers, and this was one of them. The caliber 1920, beautifully made with a Breguet overcoil hairspring and a snail cam micrometric regulator. Tears come to my eyes when I look at the photos of this thing in the auction catalog. And here's the part that's really going to make you cry. Antecorum's own estimate is that someone walks away with this watch in their pocket naturally, for 7,300 US dollars to 9,400. The high estimate isn't even five figures. Again, if you get it for that range or even a little bit above, consider it well bought. But like I said, you might have to pry it away from me. I might go to the mat on this one. <laughs> now, 
just recently, again the last two weeks, we're talking about recent events, but we can tie it into history and this upcoming auction. We saw the new Atmos 568, the third of the Atmos atmospheric perpetual motion clocks designed for JLC by Mark Newson. Mark Newson, well known out of Australia, but a world citizen and world traveler, known for his biomorphic designs, combining organic sensuous forms with machinery and modern materials. Now he's done three of these Atmos uh, clocks now since 2008, but this one at $28,000 is anything but cheap, even if it is the first Atmos by Newson to be unlimited. Lot 505 in the catalog from Antiquorum shows that Artist collaborations between JLC and well-known industrial designers are not new. Rather than paying $28,800 for the Newson 568, why don't you consider the estimate of six dollars to $8,000 for lot 505 in the Antiquorum catalog, which is an Atmos caliber 528 designed by Luigi Colani. Now the name is Italian, but the man is German. He's a well-known industrial designer, perhaps most renowned for his work in the automotive and road-going field. Best known within that segment for outrageous overland trucks. Uh, if you want to see a cross between a Buck Rogers spaceship and a Mercedes diesel semi, look up Luigi Colani and you're going to get an eyeful. Definitely worth a look, but back in the 70s, specifically in 1972, he collaborated with JLC on an Atmos and an example is going to be available, again, for six to 8,000 US at least a $20,000 discount over the Newson, and definitely a geek clock. I love the Atmos. JLC guys love the Atmos. I stole mine from Brian Govberg. It's sitting on the shelf over there. Brian, no, you can't have it back. Um, but definitely look into this. And just to end on a high note, we're just talking about the catalog here. I'm not done with the broadcast yet. But if you want to shoot for the moon, consider lot 467. Now we are in the realm of grand complications where bargains are relative. But for roughly one third of its original retail, you can have one of the 75 Reverso Triptyque Grand Complications, the first and only Reverso ever made with three dials. 19 complications. This watch has 79 jewels and 642 parts in the movement. All of platinum, it weighs three quarters of a pound and I can vouch for that, I've held one. Again, 130,000 to 170,000 US dollars is not a bargain nor is it accessible, but we are talking about one third of the original price. And considering the way these things turn into safe queens in the ultra high horology, ultra haute de gamme realm, getting a 66% discount on a watch that's probably never been on a wrist is what I consider an opportunity for someone with the taste and the means. Again, not a bargain, but definitely worth a look if you're in that if you're in that marketplace if you're looking for a grand comp they don't come any cooler than this perpetual calendar sidereal time and of course civil time all three on a single watch with a deadbeat seconds tourbillon and a unique ellipse isometer escapement that JLC only ever put on the triptyque definitely worth consideration built for the 75th anniversary of the reverso look into this one in the this year the 85th anniversary it's worth going back to the back catalog and considering something that is beyond astounding and definitely worth a look at the auction catalog even if you're not in the market. Now new watches, let's talk about affordable option. From the triptyque and six figures, let's jump to Longines. Now I've sung their praises in the past, but I wanna highlight the Aviation Chronograph Type A7 1935. Now we saw the first A7 tribute from Longines, which does heritage well back in 2012, but the watch was an unwearable 49 millimeters. A fairly accurate tribute to the 51 millimeter antecedent from 1935 that was sold to the Army Air Corps, the US Army Air Force back then. Now. The new watch is 41 millimeters in stainless steel, but it preserves the 40 degree offset crown with coaxial mono pusher for the chronograph mechanism. It's a fantastic exclusive caliber to Longines known as the L7882 column wheel, mono pusher, 54 hour power reserve, and automatic. You're getting a lot of watch and the price is right at $3,710 US. White lacquer dial recreates the porcelain of the original with beautiful blued cathedral style hands and simulated aged radium stylized Arabic numerals. A very handsome watch and again the first of the A7 tributes to actually be wearable. Now. Jumping to another bargain and yet another 
vintage tribute, more of an anniversary celebration than a specific tribute to a given reference. This watch is the Eterna Grange 1856. Now, 160th anniversary watch, a birthday present to Eterna. There are four versions with four different dials. A hundred versions are being built of each dial. Dials in black, champagne, blue, and silver. The watch is handsome and powered by an in-house caliber 3030 automatic, 4 hertz or 28,800 vibrations per hour. This one with a 48 hour power reserve and a sapphire display back. It is a sign that the Chinese ownership of Eterna is committed to the brand. Now, China Haidian has owned Eterna since it bought it from Porsche Design back in 2013. And this is a all-in-house movement built in Grenchen. Grenchen in French is Grange. So it's a celebration of Eterna as a bedrock of its city and a staple of Swiss watchmaking. So if you were afraid of what Chinese ownership, absentee ownership might do to the Eterna brand and its Swiss identity, I see this is a strong vote of confidence in the Swiss by the Chinese ownership. Again, $4,900 to $5,100 US for this watch, depending on whether you get it on leather or a double deployant steel bracelet. Handsome and a good value. I have to admit that the next new model introduction is a very particular taste, and it's a taste I do not have. I'm not going to slate the watch. I'm just going to say this watch may not excite me as much as it may excite you. But from RJ Romain Jerome comes the Pokemon Pikachu. I'll let that sink in. As a 20th anniversary, anniversaries, what's with anniversaries right now? As a 20th anniversary tribute to Pokemon and the Pokemon Company, we have 20 pieces of the Pokemon Pikachu from RJ Romain Jerome. Now, here's the thing, it's based on the Moon Invader case, so if you're familiar with that case shape, 46 millimeters titanium black PVD, it has articulated lugs that are supposed to be sort of an interpretive rendition of the landing gear of the NASA moon landers. The idea being that despite the massive case, these Teflon coated pivots will help the watch to conform more easily to a small wrist. And I can say that the system works having tried it. But again, with a giant hand painted lacquer Pikachu on the dial on a matte black lightning bolt base, this watch is not to my taste. It may be to yours. This is Tim the Diplomat doing his best. Uh, now, of course, it's equipped with a concepto movement as our most contemporary Romain Jerome watches. Uh, this one, a Romain Jerome 001, I believe, is a 23 joule Valju 7750 base built by concepto with the chronograph parts removed. Four hertz, 42 hour power reserve, unidirectional automatic winding. Again, 20 pieces at $20,000. If you were that kid, 20 years ago with uh, the Pikachu trading cards playing Pokemon. Congratulations, you're now an adult man with the means to put Pikachu on your wrist and for only $20,000, consider it a steal for your inner child. Uh, okay, wipe that nightmare from your vision. I bring you a breath of fresh air from our friends in Volkermart, Austria. The Habrings, a follow-up to the 2014 in-house caliber A11B comes the A11S for jumping seconds in the new debut Irvin from Habring of Austria. Now, Irvin is a 38.5 millimeter, 9 millimeter thick, jumping seconds timepiece with an entirely in house caliber. This is from a company that builds a maximum of 200 watches a year in Volkermark. And it's nice to know that the name on the dial is not just a real person, but two real people. IWC alumnus Richard Habring, who invented the first practical modern mass producible double chronograph or ratropont, a system he now builds uh, in improved form in-house in, -house in uh, Austria with Habring, but also his wife Maria, who's the business manager and uh, marketing chief of the company. So the two of them together, lovely couple, massive watch enthusiasts, and real enthusiasts of environmental integrity and Austrian production. They make their own movement, they do all their own watchmaking in-house, they make even small parts like the hair springs, and when they can't build it in-house, they try to source it locally from Austria. So the case, though not made by Habring, is made in Austria. And, you know, again, they have an environmental ethic that's explicit and rare in the watchmaking industry. Uh, really a bulwark against mass consumerism and disposable culture. I give them a huge thumbs up for that and also for building clean, honest, and fun watches. Absent pretense that they sell at a very honest price. Again, 
less than 200 watches a year handmade at the micro manufacturer level and they're doing this at a price of 6200 for the Irvin jumping seconds very fair uh, now all things are relative in terms of fair pricing from one German speaking watch manufacturer to another from 6200 to 57000 US dollars we see the IWC Portuguese Tourbillon DH Craig US limited edition Again, $57,000 may be a relative bargain, but for an all-in-house flying tourbillon from a really August manufacturer like IWC, I see this as a good buy for someone who might be able to talk his local distributor, it's U.S. market only, guys, into a little bit of a discount. Now, 27 pieces for U.S. boutiques and authorized retailers of standing in the U.S. The watch celebrates F.A. Jones's early financier and patron, his uncle, D.H. Craig, and part of the package you get with this watch is a little bit of IWC paraphernalia. First, you get a copy of the book F.A. Jones's Life, Legacy, and Watches, plus those of you who remember our IWC Santoni Leather Passport Holder giveaway, you get one of those for free too when you buy the watch. IWC will also be restoring a vintage clock in New York City as part of the promotion associated with this watch. And it comes with an otherwise standard IWC Flying Tourbillon caliber 98900 manual wind, 21 joules, 54 hour power reserve. It is a beautiful full balance bridge take on the flying tourbillon and it's important to note that IWC distinguishes itself from other tourbillon manufacturers by only producing flying tourbillon. They do not create that with a double bridge, one on top and one on the bottom. The tourbillon is nicely suspended and fully visible from the dial side. This is an interesting proposition to fans of IWC who might want to own a micro edition of a watch not commonly seen even in its unlimited editions. So if you're into the history of IWC, you're in the market for a tourbillon, you want a new watch warranty, and you don't mind buying a sort of micro edition promotion that I'm going to call a little bit contrived. No one knows who D.H. Craig is. I guarantee you if you ask around the IWC manufacturer, very few people know. But it's an honest tribute to a real heritage of watchmaking and a nice gesture to American collectors since IWC did have its roots as the product of an American entrepreneur. Well, I'm Tim. This was the last two weeks in watches. This is Watch You Want We will be back with Monday Mailbag and I'm going to try to put together some sort of a live chat over the weekend for those of you who might be so inclined. I'm Tim. She's Faylene Jerome, soon to be departed on vacation. This is Watch You Want. Thanks for logging on.